So Marcos, you're ready, right? We can start? Yes, yes, absolutely. Okay, so today we are uh, very happy to have uh, Marcos Marinho from Geneva and he's gonna tell us about peacock patterns or how to extract integer invariants from perturbative series. Please take it away. Yeah, thanks a lot for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. I, I noticed that some people might have already heard parts of this story. So um, I'm sorry if I, if, if, you know, if it is boring in some parts, but I will actually tell some uh, maybe new things uh, that uh, were obtained in a recent paper with Diego. So let me give you a sort of like a wide um, context for this talk, um, which is uh, essentially uh, based on, on a very old fashioned technique in quantum theory, which is perturbation theory. So perturbation theory in uh, an appropriate small parameter, it's actually one of the most useful approaches to quantum theories is something that we learn in in, in, in undergrad as graduate students. Um, and you know it's really a universal technique and this is one of its uh, more important features. It's something that you can apply in a wide, a wide uh, uh, class of situations. Now, sometimes you know that perturbation theory is not uh, really enough to give you all the information on your physical problem. And it's uh, usually said that you need information, additional information from non-perturbative sectors. It turns out that to make clear what is a perturbative sector and what is a non-perturbative sector is a more subtle uh, question that you could think at first glance. And one of the aspects of this complication is that it turns out that um, uh, the information of non-perturbative sectors is very often encoded in some appropriate way in the original perturbative series. So you cannot really separate perturbative and non-perturbative sectors in a very uh, sharp way. And uh, it's actually, uh, there is actually a full theory to actually relay these two aspects of, of, of quantum theories, which is uh, the theory of resurgence. And, and this is essentially my main uh, technical tool in, in this talk. Now, the theory of resurgence involves a, a very beautiful and challenging mathematics. And uh, as we will see in a moment, for mathematically, it allows us to pass from the walls of uh, asymptotic uh, power series, which are the typical series that appear in in, in quantum calculations in perturbation theory to the world of uh, complex functions under underlying geometry. And this is going to be also very important in the talk. So, uh, so one uh, more um, specific aspect of resurgence that I, I will try to uh, emphasize in this talk is the following. Now, resurgence is a very universal technique that can be applied in many, in many, in many cases. But it turns out that in some particular cases, there are hidden integrality structures appearing in perturbation theory when you use this uh, framework of analysis. And as we will see, it turns out that this integrality structure is actually not uh, um, something unheard of. It's actually related to something that we like a lot in supersymmetric gauge theories and string theories, which is the counting of VPS states. So I will also try to explain how there is a relationship between this theory of resurgence and the theory of VPS states. And I will focus on two examples where this relation seems to be uh, important, which are complex string Simons theory and topological string theory. And the, the, the first part of the talk, which I'm, I'm going to focus on complex string Simons theory is based mostly on work with Stavros Garufalidis and Diego. And then I will uh, turn in the last part of the talk to more recent work on topological strings, uh, with, which I did with my postdoc Diego. Okay. So let me start uh, with, uh, with some sort of uh, formal definitions, which I hope are going to be simple, but uh, uh, are going to be really the, the kind of main, uh, I, main technique I will use in my talk. So as I mentioned before, um, the, the starting point for this analysis is going to be a perturbative series. And perturbative series in quantum theory and in many quantum field theories are typically factorially divergent. So, I'm going, my, my original mathematical object is going to be then an asymptotic formal power series, phi of z, which uh, I'm going to write in this way. So this is really a formal series. It's not defined in a function. And these coefficients a n grow like n factorial. So the, the reason why this doesn't, define a function, this doesn't define a function is because this series has zero radius of convergence due to this factorial growth. Now, this type of series are sometimes called uh, uh, Gebre 1 series. And if you want to make sense of this series, you can do it through uh, this uh, theory of resurgence. And I'm actually going to use a small part of this in this talk. And this small part of the theory will actually involve a very simple notion, which is the notion of Borel transform. 
So the idea of Borel transform is precisely, as I was mentioning before, going from a formal power series, which is not really well defined, to an, a function which is analytic at the origin, and then where you will be able to use all the powerful tools of complex analysis. Now, the way to do this is actually deceptively simple. So the only thing you have to do is to take this a n, which grows like n factorial, and essentially divided by n factorial. So you cut this factorial growth in such a way that the series that you obtain here, which I'm going to call Borel transform of my original series, is going to have typically a final radius of convergence. So, so this, this, this function, as I said, uh, is, is analytic at the origin typically. And then when you analytically continue to the full complex plane, you will find a very rich uh, structure of singularities, which can be of all kinds. You can have poles, you can have branch cuts, it can be logarithmic or it can be exponential branch cuts and so on. And uh, I will refer to this uh, plane of this uh, addition, this auxiliary variable zeta as the Borel plane. And uh, in this Borel plane, there will be a rich structure of singularities defined by this uh, uh, analytic continuation of the Borel transform. Okay, so 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 far we have what we have done is we start with a theory in which we have a perturbative series that can appear, for example, in quantum mechanics, and then we go to this Borel transform and we realize that this Borel transform has a nice analytic structure. So what else can we do with, with, with this? Now, in, intuitively, it's clear that the region around the origin is giving you information about the original perturbative series, because remember that this series was just obtained by dividing the original coefficient by n factorial. So the question you can ask now is, what kind of information is encoded in the additional singularities that you find in this Borel plane? And it turns out that these singularities in the Borel plane are going to tell you about the additional sectors, the additional non perturbative sectors, actually, that this theory might have. So the way you do this mathematically is again very simple. Now, as I said, you know, let's take this uh, Borel transform, let's look at the singularities, and let's do a local expansion of this analytically continuous function around the singularities. Now, when you do that, what you will find is that you actually obtain new formal power series. So let me explain you how this goes, uh, how this, this happens, because it's actually quite simple. So let's assume, for example, that you have a branch cut with a log singularity, so a logarithmic branch cut in, the, in this Borel plane. This is actually quite standard, and as we'll see, as we will see, uh, even realistic examples like complex chern Simon's theory fall into this category. So uh, when you expand around, uh, you have a logarithmic branch cut, you will have a, a, the singularity like this, but multiplying this singularity, you will have a local expansion around this singularity, which will be, um, which will be an analytic function at this singularity. So you have an analytic function of the singularity times a logarithm, a logarithm. And then I can introduce, once I normalize, I choose a normalization for this function, as we will see in a moment, uh, you, you know, this is something that can be done uh, very often, very naturally. Um, I, I will actually introduce as well a number multiplying this function, which I'm going to call a Stokes constant. Okay, as I, as I, uh, as is very clear, you know, this, the definition of this is of constant depends on the normalization of this series. But as I mentioned before, this can be done naturally in many examples. So this is an analytic function, but this analytic function can be actually, uh, um, you can actually do the inverse of a Borel transform in order to obtain an asymptotic power series starting from this local expansion. So you expand around the logarithm, you have, uh, you have an analytic function at this point, there will be coefficients appearing in this, in this, in this series. Yeah? And then you, multi you, you multiply these coefficients by n factorial and you get a factorial divergent series attached to this singularity which I have located at zeta omega. So, so this is actually the magic of this theory that just by, you start with the perturbative series, you look at the analytic continuation of this Borel transform, and then you see that around each singularity of this Borel transform, you find new sectors, sectors which were in a sense invisible in your original analysis, but actually reappear, appear uh, in some sort of hidden way when you do this procedure. Uh, and actually, it has been uh, verified in many examples, and in some cases has been proved that these additional series correspond to additional sectors. Uh, if, for example, you start with a quantum theory, this additional series corresponds to additional sectors of the path integral corresponding, for example, to instanton sectors. So this is a way 
of finding non perturbed sectors starting from perturbation theory. And you see that there is a, an interesting, uh, an interesting uh, structure, uh, analytic structure, and in particular, there will be these const those constants here, which will play a role later on. Now, uh, so you see that you start with a series, you get more series, and then you can repeat this procedure. You can now start with this additional series and do the same thing. You do a, a Borel transform, you look at their singularities, you span around the singularities, you will get more series, and you will make more and more. And eventually, you get a full collection of, of series. So at some point, this procedure stops, and you will get a full set of formal power series, which correspond to the all possible sectors of the theory, which are hidden in your original perturbative expansion. Okay? And the information you will get from that, from, from, from all this, I'm going to collect it in this, in this uh, collection of, of, of different power series, which I'm going to label by omega. So omega is a label for all the possible power series that I will get. And then after choosing an appropriate normalization for all these series, I will get a matrix of Stokes constants. Okay? So this matrix of Stokes constants is telling me essentially the leading coefficient of the relationship between this series and their logarithmic singularities. Again, I'm assuming a logarithmic singularity for the, for the sake of, of simplicity. And all the examples I'm going to use in this talk fall into this category, but you can generalize this very simply. So, so what you obtain in this way is what we call a minimal resorting structure. You started with a series and then like- Because you know, there's a question by yes, Greg, please. why does the procedure stop? Well, that's, uh, that's, I mean, it might stop after an infinite number of series. So, you know, this, this might involve an infinite number of sectors. So it stops in that sense. But actually, the, uh, the, 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 the idea that it stops is actually a conjectural property of this, of this theory is that essentially at some point, you know, uh, you, you will not get uh, more structure. Uh, I mean, you will not get more series in this game. But indeed, it couldn't, it could happen that it doesn't stop even after an infinite number of steps. But the fact is that uh, in, most, in, in all examples, we know this eventually stops. And essentially, you have to, you have to be able to, 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 to follow the thread until you eventually uh, notice that you are not going to get more series. Okay? But indeed, you know, you, this, this, this can be proved as a theorem in some, in some simple examples. For example, when these series are obtaining um, in the context of ordinary differential equations, uh, but it's a fact of life that in all known examples, this stops at some point. But I, 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 it's a good question because indeed there is nothing that I said so far that actually guarantees that this is going to stop at some point. Okay. Except there are a couple if, more questions. Tor yes. is asking similarly, why does the set of omega stabilize? And Greg is sort of countering. Sorry, the, I, I meant um, what, like, so, so you get some, you get some set of omegas, and then you repeat this procedure. Yes. Um, how do you know that the previous ones, in particular, are going to a, a, appear again? Sorry. Is, is 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 there something telling you that that previous omegas are going to appear at subsequent steps in the iteration? That's maybe a simpler. I mean, you know, it might happen that you know that the omegas that appear uh, in in the iteration. I mean. Uh, at some point, you close the system, right? But, uh, yeah, um, but, uh, yeah, Marcos, I'm wondering if, if when you translate it to gauge theory, it isn't something like, uh, you know, it'll stop for Archer's Douglas theories, but, um, not for other theories or something like that. And maybe yeah. Tudor's wondering that too. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I can, I can give you, for example, you know, uh, and, and, you know, the example, for, for example, if in ordinary differential equations. So, so if you take, for example, one, one ordinary differential equation that we are very used to in, in, in string theory, which is the pan level one equation. In pan level one equation, when you look at the solution that describes to the gravity, you will get one of these perturbative series. And then if you look at the resorting structure of this perturbative series, you will actually find uh, an infinite series of, of additional, of additional uh, objects. Mm? And each of them will give another tower of objects and so on and so forth. So you have actually um, a kind of very complicated uh, structure, but in which uh, essentially you will get an infinite number of, of functions of this type, but they can all be described in closed form. Mm? So, um, so, so essentially, you know, the, the, at the end of the day, you can describe the structure completely. Mm? 
but uh, these are in, an infinite number of, of, of functions that you find. I mean, maybe, you know, if we discuss kind of, kind of more concrete examples later on, I, I can explain you how this appears in these examples. Uh, you know, the, the, I mean, so far the, the discussion has been quite abstract and maybe the, the only point that has to be uh, taken at this point is that there will be an infinite number of, of, of functions that you can describe explicitly and these functions will come with these those constants that in principle you have to compute although it is not always simple what do the functions compute in in, in this in this example that you just said in which example in the in the in the pen level one uh, oh in the pen level one these theories are actually related to the brain contributions to the to the to the free energy of, of the minimal string so so the the in general this this series correspond to non-perturbative sectors. And this depends on the theory you are looking at. If you are in a gauge theory, they are going to describe instant non-sectors or what are called renormal non-sectors. If you are in a string theory, they are going to be typically describing, say, D-brain instant non-sectors and so on. But uh, the formal description is always the same. It's always all, all these examples follow this pattern. So it's a, it's a really universal structure. Now, uh, let me focus on these those constants which are often complicated numbers. For example, in the case of pan level one that I was mentioning, these are actually rational numbers. Now, there are some examples in which uh, these uh, those constants are actually integers. And for example, when you are studying this, this type of structure in, in, in the asymptotic expansion of integrals, it can be easily seen that these uh, uh, numbers are integers because they correspond to intersection numbers of integration paths. And actually what I'm going to to describe uh, later on is a slightly more general example where you have you can have an infinite number of these in, of these those constants, but they are still preserving the integrality structure. Now, for me, the integrality structure is actually very interesting because it makes a bridge between an analytic structure on one hand, which is coming from all these perturbative series, and then an integrality structure associated to these those constants. And this, in a sense, is a, some sort of generalization or similar relationships that have been discussed recently in the literature between analytic type of problems, like for example, Riemann-Hilbert problems, and on the other hand, integra integrality structures. And this was uh, uh, very much emphasized in the work by Gayoto, Moore, and Nitzke, and has been taken, um, has been developed more mathematically recently by Bridgeland. And I think this is a very interesting interplay between analytic and integrality structures, and in a sense, resurgence it's a more general framework where this can take place. In a sense, what uh, uh, Greg and, 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 and Gayoto and Nitzke found and what Brisbane is discussing are, in a sense, particular examples of this probably more general structure. So, so let me give you a very elementary example, which uh, appears in, in the case of elementary functions like uh, the AED function. So the AED function, uh, when you do uh, the asymptotic expansion, is going to involve a formal power series, which I wrote here, is actually a relatively complicated expression, but you can see very easily that this is a factorial divergent power series. This coefficient here grows like n factorial. And in this case, it's very nice to do this exercise of, of resurgence because the Borel transform can be computed in quite close form and it's just a hypergeometric function. And when you have an hypergeometric function, it's very easy to locate these singularities. So you just see here that there is going to be a logarithmic type of singularity on the negative real axis. So this is something that you can, that I, I just put here. The, the structure of the world plane is very simple. There is a region of analyticity around the origin. There is the closest singularity here on the negative real axis. And now you can do this game of expanding this Borel transform around the logarithmic singularity that appears here. And when you do that, you will find another formal power series, you can actually work this very explicitly by using elementary properties of geometric functions. And what you will get is a different formal power series. Remember that this one here has this minus sign, so it's an alternating power series. And when you do this exercise of looking at the other formal power series that appears here, you find a series which is, non, uh, which is no longer alternating. And it's interesting because you can regard this as the instant on sector of the AD function. And it's actually the, the formal power series which appears in the, in the asymptotics of the other AD function, the B function. Now, the those constants here are very easy to calculate. And you can see that they are just one. Okay, so this is an example in which you have integer those constants. And one way to see this 
is precisely by thinking about AD functions as uh, in, when you just you write them in, in integral form. And then you can see that um, you know these stores constants are going to be given by by, by an integer. And this is related to the path that you write uh, when you write the stores constants in terms of the integral form. Okay. So this is How a very simple. Things are normalized here. Why is it? What is the nature of normalization of this phi? Well, the natural normalization is precisely that these two functions appear uh, as asymptotic expansions of an integral, and then this fixes the normalization in this way. Also, here I have I have I have chosen a normalization in which the first term is just one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very good. So let's now. I mean. The calculation of those constant is, is a highly non-trivial exercise. So, so as I said, for example, even in Palneve one, there is an infinite family of those constants which have not been computed analytically in the literature. There are some uh, there are some uh, conjectures to what are, what is their form, but in general, it's, it's, it's a it's a kind of very complicated exercise. Now, uh, I'm going to actually address this problem uh, in, 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 a, in a setting in which, as you will see, one can actually eventually get an exact answer. And this is the context of chern simons theory, complex chern simons theory on a three manifold M. And this is a very interesting theory from many points of view. And also from the point of view of, of, of the theory of resurgence, chern simons theory is a very interesting theory because it's a theory which is on one hand exactly solvable in many senses, and at the same time, it gives highly non-trivial perturbative expansions. So I'm going to focus on a very specific example, which is the case in which we have complex churn simons theory with gauge group SL to Z on the complement of hyperbolic norm. Now, in these cases, it has been argued from many points of view that the partition function of the theory can be actually reduced, reduced to a finite dimensional integral, which is sometimes called the state integral. So this was developed by many people. Uh, including Tudor, whom I see is here. And, and it was uh, formally uh, formalized uh, in a very rigorous way by Anderson and Kasai. So I will sometimes mention this as, refer to this as the Anderson Kasai invariant. So this is actually an interesting example because, uh, in a sense, the path integral reduces to an um, ordinary integral. And then um, you can analyze this in a relatively easy way. But as, as we will see, this is substantially more complicated than the standard functions defined by integrals for reasons that I will explain in a moment. Now, uh, in this theory, uh, I will actually, uh, for those of you who know the subject, I will actually focus on, on, on a special point in the moduli space of this uh, complement of hyperbolic node, which is the point which corresponds to, a, to the globally hyperbolic metric. Uh, so, so essentially, this means for in practical terms that my series will be a series in one, uh, my, my, my state integral will be just a function of a single parameter, which is a complex parameter tau, which is defined for the whole complex plane minus the negative real axis. And you can think about this tau as the complex coupling of the theory and plays essentially the role of H bar. So the building block of these integrals are Fadeyev's quantum dial logarithm, but I will not need the, the precise description at this moment. So you, you can, if you have questions, I, 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 can, I can answer if I know the answer. Now, so what do you do with this? Marcos, you said that you said the hyperbolic metric is a um, complete hyperbolic metric is a, a point in the moduli space. I thought that was one of the flat connections. Yes, so, in the in the moduli it was space, a, it's a stationary point around which you expand. Yeah, I mean there is a I mean the, uh, I'm, I think about the moduli space of flat connections, and in this moduli space of flat connections, there is a special point. Okay, I got it. Which is okay. Yeah. So, so this integral should mimic the full path integral of complex terms and It should be equivalent to it. And this means that you know, the expansions, uh, this integral should be expanded around points which correspond to semi-classical solutions of, of the theory. And these are flat complex connections, which I'm going to label by the, by the letter sigma. So sigma here will denote uh, uh, flat connections in this, uh, in this manifold, in this manifold here, okay? Now, um, so these are, these are, as I said, these are special points in the moduli space of cut connections. So I'm going to turn, I'm, I'm going to turn off the deformation parameters. Okay, so I'm going to look at these special points. Now, uh, when you span this integral around these special points, what you will have is the exponential of the classical action of these flat connections, which is a complex uh, uh, object. It has this form here. So you see that tau plays the role of h bar, and then this will, we actually multiply 
a factorially divergent series. Eh? So it's a, a superturbative series in your coupling constant tau. And this is a factorial divergent series as is usually the case in quantum theories. Now, uh, among these, uh, con these connections, as I said, there is the geometric connection G, which corresponds to ge geodesically complete hyperbolic on M. And there is also the conjugate connection to this, uh, to this geodesically complete hyperbolic metric. And in some complicated, I mean, in, in, gen in general, you will have other discrete uh, flat connections. Uh, but in, in the example I will look in, 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 in concretely, which is the figure A naught, there will only be these two connections, the geometric connection and the conjugate connection. So this, these are, you want two special saddle points for this theory. And uh, they are very important because uh, the, the, the real part of the classical action on these uh, connections is actually the hyperbolic volume of the knot. Okay, so, so these are actually the, these are actually asymptotic series which are uh, deeply related to the volume conjecture for this uh, state integral invariance. So, so the semi-classical behavior of this quantum invariant gives you a classical geometric invariant of the theory, which is the hyperbolic volume of the knot. Okay. Okay. So, so you see when uh, so so let's let's then consider the asymptotic expansion around one. As I said, I'm going to consider the example of the yes. So I'm going to consider the, the example of the hyperbolic node where there are just these two flat connections. And then one, con one can consider the perturbative expansion around them, okay? And since these are factorial divergent series, you can actually look at the structure of the Borel singularities in the Borel plane. Now, when you look, when you have a theory in which there are two classical saddle points, like in this case, the Borel plane of of, of one of them has to tell you about the other one, right? And this is part of the game of, of resurgence that, uh, the, you know, the singularities in the Borel plane are telling you about the other sectors of the theory. So when you do the, the when you do analyze the Borel plane of this series expanding around the geometric con this geometric connection, you should have a singularity which corresponds to the other connection. Mm -hmm. And the other way around, when you look at the Borel plane of this complex conjugate connection, you should see a singularity which corresponds to the other geometric connection. Okay, so this is, in a sense, the classical structure of singularities that you would find in any theory with two saddle points. Now, uh, the expansions of this, you know, these these uh, expansions are actually quite rich. Uh, they have given some interesting number theoretic properties. And uh, let me point out that uh, the expansion around the geometric connection is quite important because this is what uh, is called the all orders Kashaev invariant of this uh, hyperbolic knot. And this is exactly the same power series that appears when you consider the volume conjecture for the, for the Jones polynomial. So also these invariants are based on, on, on these state integrals. Uh, the asymptotic expansion around this geometric connection is the one that appears in the Jones polynomial. And let me also point out that in this case, these two series are actually related by a simple involution, which is taking tau to minus tau. Okay, so this is a very simple theory with two flat connections, and you know, um, and then you know, uh, the Borel plane of one has to know about the other, and vice versa. So this is a, a nice picture, and and of course, you know, since you have this singularity here, you can also compute this those constant, and this is not very hard. You can actually. Uh, computed in many ways, and this was done by many people. Uh, uh, but there is an additional complica complication. There is an additional interesting thing, which actually gives the crucial twist to this story. And the crucial twist is that the churn simons action has uh, multivalueness. It's a multivalued action. So this means that uh, in, in reality, you shouldn't expect a single singularity corresponding to this classical connection, but you should actually expect an infinite tower of additional singularities, which corresponds to the different multivaluedness of this complex Chern Simons action. So, actually, the action uh, should actually be, uh, uh, you should consider all the possible uh, coverings of this action by an integer n. And, and you, you should actually expect seeing all these uh, additional singularities in the complex plane of this Borel transform. So when you actually look at the Borel transform of this power series, you should not only see this uh, classical flat connection, but you should see actually a full tower of singularities equally spaced according to the multivalence of the chern simons action. And this is really what happens when you actually look at this Borel transform, you just don't have one single singularity, you have an infinite tower on them. And this is where this theory is 
infinitely more complicated than, say, the theory corresponding to the AD function that we were studying. I mean, in a sense, this uh, original picture looks a little bit like an AD function, hmm? Look, you know, with an additional singularity telling you about the other series. But when you take into account the multivalence of chern simons theory, then this gets these infinite towers, which are going to give us many interesting information. OK. So, so since these towers appear all the time, we thought that we should give them a name. And then we, we decided to call them peak of patterns. This was proposed by Stavros Garufali, this one of our collaborators. Because when you write, uh, when you write the rays that go from the origin to these, uh, to these singularities, you seem to have uh, you know, the, the different feathers in a, in the in the in the in, in a peacock, huh? so you see this this the, the eyes of the feathers looked uh, like the Borel singularities in the Borel plane, and actually the peacock should be put into a in front of a pond because you know typically you have singularities both up um, in the bottom upper plane and in the lower upper plane. Okay, um, and actually uh, as I said, this is a quite a recurrent phenomenon, and in, in retrospect you you realize that. Uh, what people find in many other examples actually fits into this pattern. So these infinite hours of singularities appear in many other contexts, like for example, topological string theory. And actually one of the first examples is a paper by Sarah with Ricardo Schiappa where they actually uh, show this. And I will come back if time allows to, to these top examples in topological string theory later on. So, um, so let me point out that from the point of view of, uh, of of physics, these uh, uh, towers of singularity are, in, are incredibly important because remember that uh, you have to, uh, the, the classical action should be divided by tau. Huh? So the, when you think about uh, this multivalueness, remember that at the end of the day, I should have a one over tau here, right? In, in the physical weight of, of, of these singularities. Now, when you have a tau here, you realize that, uh, um, that all these singularities corresponds to a tiny non-perturbative corrections, which are of the order q twiddle to the n, where q twiddle is this quantity, which is the exponential of minus two pi over tau. So it's in a sense an S dual of the standard uh, complex uh, of, of, of tau, of the, of the complex coupling of the theory. And you can see that if tau is very obviously small, uh, these quantities are going to be very small. So these singularities physically, are actually telling you about incredibly small non perturbative corrections which should appear in the theory due to these multivalued uh, instant on sectors of complex and Simon's theory. Now, um, uh, the, the, remember that the Borel singularities tell you about this additional sector. So maybe here we can see a kind of concrete example of how these sectors look like. Now, uh, for each classical, in quotation marks, uh, uh, flat connection, we will have a tower of singularities. So the, the, the singularities in the Borel plane are going to label by two numbers, one uh, by two indices, one in the sigma, which labels the, 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 the connection. For example, in this case, we have the geometric and the conjugate connection. And then on top of that, we will have an additional integer n. Okay, so here you already see an infinite number of sectors due to this tower of singularities. And remember also that the Stokes constants are labeled, Stokes constants are matrices relating one power, one formal power series to another. And they will be labeled by these two, the, two of these omegas. So they are labeled by two classical connections and two integers. Now, uh, when we first saw these singularities, we thought that, you know, since they were doing, the, the, they, were due, they were due to multivalueness they should be very trivial. In a sense, they, they, they couldn't be very complicated. And actually, it turns out that, uh, in a sense, they are quite simple. Uh, one way in which you can see that they are not that complicated uh, is that the power series associated to them, this phi sigma tau, remember that associated to each singularity, I have a different formal power series. Now, you could, you, 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 it's intuitively, it seems intuitively clear that since there is multivalueness, this is due to the multivalueness, this, the different series corresponding to different ends cannot be infinitely complicated. And that actually is true. You can actually see that the formal power series associated to, um, to, to different ends are obtained by the, the, the power series associated to n equals zero times just this factor q twiddle to the n. So this essentially is just a classical contribution due to the 
classical action uh, uh, due to this uh, additional um, uh, multivalence of Chern Simon. So, so in a sense, the, these additional sectors are not very complicated because they don't really give you completely different series. They just give you the, uh, or the series for n equals zero times some q to l to the n. So this is quite simple. And we thought for a long time that the Stokes constants would be equally simple, but there we were wrong. There we were very wrong because it turns out, uh, well, first of all, let me, let me mention that because of all these, uh, all these n's are just obtained by multiplying by q to l to the n, you just can't remove uh, one of, you can always put one integer in this Stokes constant to zero. Uh, and then, you know, there is some sort of translation invariance here. So essentially the Stokes constant only depends on two uh, on the two classical uh, um, uh, saddle points and one single integer. But it turns out that these Stokes constants are actually incredibly non-trivial integers. Mm -hmm. And we, the, the way we discover this is the hard way by just calculating them numerically. And when we calculate them numerically, we found that with very high precision, these numbers were actually integers after using the natural normalization of this series appearing from the expansion of the state integral, uh, they were really giving you a highly non-trivial collection of integer invariants of the norm. So I wrote uh, some of them for you. So you can see that uh, you know, these are highly non-trivial integers. Uh, and as I said, you, you can calculate them. And you can calculate them numerically at to relatively high order. These are very, cal very complicated calculations because you are really proving exponentially small corrections to the theory. So these are really very tiny corrections that you have to really control. Now, once we compute the sum of these, of these integers, we started looking at them in order to try to understand what they were. And it turns out that the first thing we realize is that for the tower, which is on top of the origin, these numbers could actually be identified. You have read enough papers on the context of on complex change and theory. It turns out that these integers are actually nothing but the the uh, mofte gayoto gukov index of this hyperbolic norm. And this was a, a, a very nice realization. So let me just uh, remind you that the D, the DG in the, the DGG index uh, can be thought in two ways. Mathematically, can be thought as an in, uh, uh, as a Q series, which is an invariant of the hyperbolic knot, and it can also be physically interpreted as a BPS, as a counting of BPS states in a 3D superconformal field theory, which is in a sense dual to this hyperbolic knot. So these are very beautiful constructions due to the Mofte, Gayot, and Gukov, and we we found that these Stokes constants that appear in the context of resurgence can act Actually, uh, at least in this case of, the DG of, of, this, of this tower can be completely identified with the DG index for in the case of, um, uh, for those of you who are familiar with this, this corresponds, this tower corresponds to the case in which the magnetic charges are zero, okay? Uh, now, after looking at this even more carefully, we have, uh, we realize that actually all the Stokes constants can be related to the DG index. Eh? Once you include magnetic charges, so the first tower here corresponds to the to the case of magnetic charge equal to zero, but the other towers can be recovered when you turn on a non-trivial uh, magnetic uh, magnetic charge. Okay, so all these Stokes constants can be eventually explained in terms of it can be related to this DGG index, and uh, and and essentially you can see that these integer numbers then by using this uh, connection to 3D superconformal field theory are actually counting BPS states. And a very important ingredient in this story is that uh, uh, is actually the holomorphic uh, factorization of this state integral. So these factor, this, uh, 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 this state integrals can be factorized and the factorization turns out to have implications for this calculation of Stokes constant. It's actually a different calculation because in factorization, you don't really split your state integral in terms of perturbative series plus non-perturbative corrections. You split the, the state integral in a product of a Q series times a Q twiddle series, but uh, one can actually show that this has implications for this, uh, uh, for this uh, resurgence uh, analysis. And eventually this leads to this result that I was mentioning here. Now, in a sense, uh, uh, from that point of view, it's, it's very interesting that these Stokes constants are integers and these integers have a physical meaning. 
But in a sense, uh, um, uh, what is actually important from the point of view of resolution is that this is one of the few examples in quantum theory in which you can actually compute all these those constants in closed form. I mean, not computed because, as I said, we just computed a few uh, integers, and then the other ones, we essentially conjecture them from uh, uh, by using all these relations. So this is this will be regarded more like as a conjecture, but it's a conjecture which gives you the exact answer for this uh, Stokes constant, and this is actually a highly non-trivial result in resolvance. As I said, you know there are not many theories in which you have an infinite number of Stokes constants that can be determined explicitly. Uh, in particular, uh, this also gives you a full decomposition of this quantum invariant, uh, a full semi-classical decoding of this quantum invariant, because one can see that these two constants are exactly what you need in order to write your quantum invariant as a borel brisson perturbative series plus the contribution of non-trivial instanton sectors. Okay, so this is the kind of thing that you would like to do in more realistic quantum field theory is to be able to write the full path integral as a full semi-classical expression in which you have contributions from the different saddle points explicitly and so on. This is something, by the way, that you can do in compact chain Simons theory. And this was, uh, but in, in, in the case of complex chain Simons theory, you really need to know an infinite number of information encoded in these those constants if you want to do it uh, really in a complete way. Okay, so so, so um, this is Marcos, before you yeah. move on to topological yeah. strings. Yeah, I, I, I missed it. What, what is the conceptual reason why the Stokes matrices of complex churn Simons should be related to the BPS state counting? I still don't have a complete uh, conceptual understanding of this. Um, uh, I don't think, uh, I mean, I. I, I, I don't think this is completely unexpected. Uh, and as I said, you know, uh, the structure of holomorphic factorization tells you that these things have to be related in, in, in some way. But uh, I, I don't have an a priori uh, derivation of this. Okay, so it's a conjecture. Yeah, it's a conjecture. Everything here is a conjecture. It's a conjecture that they are integer. It's a conjecture that they are given by this form. And, and, uh, and as I said, the holomorphic factorization gives you constraints which point out to this structure, but they don't give you really a proof of this. Okay? So, uh, so I think one should, it's actually interesting because uh, you see, after all, this state integral is a simple integral. So you could think that this, in, uh, even forgetting about complex chain Simon's theory, you could actually ask yourself, how is it possible that uh, in the case of the figure I notice that just a one dimensional integral has an infinite number of power series which have these such complicated uh, Stokes constants. This means that um, there must be an infinite number of saddle points, and around this infinite number of saddle points, there must be uh, left symbols which intersect in a very complicated way so as to give you all these kind of non-trivial integer numbers. So already the problem from the point of view of one-dimensional integrals is quite uh, is quite subtle, I would say. And of course, this is related to the fact that these integrals involve the quantum dilogarithm, which is a non-trivial function. So it's so it's in a sense it's, it's a next step beyond uh, beyond doing ordinary functions or the ordinary saddle point expansions of integrals. Marcos, oh, yes. Uh, does the theory you wrote, like the the 3D uh, theory that you wrote, uh, have a global symmetry? Uh, well, um, maybe you should ask this to Tudor. Uh, I, I, what do you mean? Are you my, one my question is that uh, in this index computation, if you have yes. a global symmetry, then you can refine with the fugacity for that symmetry. Oh, yeah, yeah, then, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, 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 you know, of course, yeah, sorry, sorry. I thought you were mentioning other, yeah, yeah, of course, you know, no. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, of course, you have, there are fugacities related to the electric charges and to the magnetic charges. And here, I'm, I'm actually summing over all electric charges. And then when I consider these other towers, I have to introduce mm -hmm. the fugacity. I mean more like this eight and nine can be written as sums of power. So some, if there is a symmetry, so it can, it, it, this should be characters of the symmetry. So you don't- Yes, 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 yes. yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, actually, as I said, here you are actually summing overall, uh, you are tracing overall possible electric charges. And then here you have to consider sectors with fixed magnetic charge. Yeah, mm -hmm. but there are definitely U1 symmetries in that sense. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And does this structure have any meaning in terms of resurgence, this more refined structure? Well, uh, there is actually, that's a very good question. So you can actually refine this theory from the point of view of the power series themselves, 
by introducing the deformation of the of the of the of the, of the flat connections that I was mentioning before. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in the case of the figure you know, this means that you will have a one parameter deformation of this series that I was showing you. Now, when you introduce this deformation in the moduli space of metrics, in the moduli space of complex flat connections, then this will reappear in the calculation of this index as precisely this fugacity that you were mentioning. So the putting back the fugacity for the electric charges is equivalent to in the in the in the in the perturbative in the perturbative expansion is equivalent to turning on the deformation in the model space. So you can actually see that these numbers become poly Laurent polynomials in this fugacity, and it's a refinement of this structure. Absolutely, yes. Thank you. So there is a refinement both in the perturbative side, in the perturbative series side, which gets reflected uh, as a refinement in the counting of VPS states. Absolutely. Okay, so, so now, uh, as I mentioned uh, before, some of these uh, peak of patterns appear before in, in topological string theory. So we wanted to understand, you know, uh, if there were some similar structures appearing in, in, in this story. Uh, and, and now, when, the main difference between um, between topological strings and, and complex strings in most theory is the following. Now, in topological string theory, you really have more than one parameter, right? I mean, uh, you have the string coupling constant, but then you have all the moduli of the Calabi-Jau. And if you think in terms of large end duality, you know that the string coupling constant corresponds to the ca gauge coupling constant of, of a gauge theory, and the modulus plays the role of a tough parameter. Now, it's always better when you analyze uh, resorting structures to have, um, to have a power series in a single parameter. For example, if you study the resurgence properties of a gauge theory, it's better to consider a gauge theory with a fixed rank hmm, and then study the st st standard perturbative series in the coupling constant for different values of the rank. Hmm. Now, if you want to do this, in, 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 you want to, even if you wanted to do something like this in topological string theory, what you would we would like to, we, uh, what you would like to do is to consider a power series in topological string theory, which are factorial power series with just a single parameter, so that the story doesn't get too much complicated. Now, if you think so, this would mean that you would have to consider a, a perturbative series in topological string theory, uh, in which, in a sense, you put the top parameter equal to a n times the topological string constant. And this is essentially, remember that going to low rank in gauge theory corresponds in the, in, the, in the string theory dual to taking the tensionless limit of the, of the string. Now, the tensionless limit of the topological string is more or less speaking the conifold point of the Calabi-Jau because this is where the, um, essentially where, where the, the, the parameter gets, uh, gets small. Huh? And, and then, you know, what the, all this suggests is that if you want to start doing something simple in topological string theory, you shouldn't look at the expansion on the, the, the large volume limit because this is going to be quite complicated. Um, you should actually look at the expansion of topological string theory near the conifold point of the Calabi-Jau. And this is also interesting because the expansion on the conifold point of the Calabi-Jau has been always mysterious to me in the sense that um, the, the kind of numbers that appear when you do this expansion do not really have a clear geometric interpretation. I mean, you do the expansion at large radius it's obvious that you are counting holomorphic curves. If you span around the orbifold point, you can interpret this in terms of orbifold gram of width and theory. But the expansion on the conifold point has been for me always kind of relatively mysterious. So, so it's, it's actually interesting that, uh, that uh, the simplest type of perturbative series that you can get in the logical string theory are actually expansion around the conifold point. So, so, so what you do then is you, you you take uh, your topological string theory, and instead of studying the expansion on a large radius, you, stand, you, start, you study the expansion on the conifold point. And this means that you have to consider the topological string theory in the conifold frame. This would be very similar to doing cyber width and theory in magnetic variables. So when you do this, uh, remember that the topological string theory will give you a family of uh, higher uh, genus G partition functions, which are going to depend on a modulus lambda. The modulus lambda here is the is the conifold modulus. It's a it's a flat coordinate which vanishes at the conifold point, and then I will have the string coupling constant, um, uh, which is uh, I'm going to call it tau. Now, as as I was mentioning, we want to have some sort of uh, tensionless limit of this theory, so I'm going to put lambda, the modulus of the Calabi-Jau, 
equal to n times tau. This is what you would have. What you would do is you have like sort of large chain gauge duality. So uh, n here can be any positive integer, one, two, three, whatever. And this means that out of the topological string expansion near the conical point, I will get an infinite family of formal power series mm, times an exponential. And these are the power series that I'm going to that, that I'm going to focus on. So, so when you do this, the partition function of topological string theory for each value of n will give you a perturbative series in this coupling constant tau. So this perturbative series has not been studied very much, but uh, but uh, just can th think about them from the point of view of, of resurgence theory as factorially divergent series. They turn out to be factorially divergent, simply factorially divergent. And we actually conjecture that this formal power series also lead to integer storage constants. Now, when we did all this construction, which maybe doesn't seem obvious, uh, we have another important motivation in mind. And this is the following. Now, what I just described, you can do it for any Calabi-Yau, essentially. So for example, you could do this for the Quinty, by the way. So you don't have to restrict yourself to non-compact calabi or to toric cases. But in the toric case, this power series have a very interesting interpretation. Uh, it turns out that uh, in the case of toric calabi you can actually, we have, we have conjecture some time ago that uh, these series that appear here are asymptotic expansions of some quantities which are well-defined non-perturbatively. They are functions of tau which are well-defined non-perturbatively and are spectral traces of operators. So, so the, the expansion of topological string theory around the conifold point in the toric case can actually be related to a quantum mechanical model in which actually tau plays the role of inverse uh, uh, plan constant. Okay. And this is actually very useful, but it's not crucial to this resurgent structure. This resurgent structure, you can define it just from the point of view of formal power series. Okay. Let me actually remind you, for those of you who are not familiar with this result, that these, expect, these uh, operators that, uh, that appear in this interpretation are obtained by quantizing the mirror curve to x. But I just want to mention this, this important fact of life that this formal power series, in this case, have a non perturbative uh, lift to a well-defined quantity. Okay? So tau here can actually be a, a complex uh, plan constant, if you want. Now, it turns out that the structure that you find when you do this is extremely similar to the structure that you find in complex transcendence theory. No? In particular, one finds that these spectral traces, these spectral traces that of operators that I, I, I wrote down here. So these are, uh, I, I didn't actually mention, uh, analyze too much this formula. So row here is the is the operator that uh, uh, row here is the operator that appears when you do this this story, and then you have to consider what are called um, fermionic spectral traces, which means that you have to consider this operator, which is defined on L two R. You have to consider some sort of uh, anti-symmetric product uh, on on the anti-symmetric uh, on the on on the uh, on the on the Hilbert space, which is lambda n of the Hilbert space. So these are called this is what we call fermionic spectral traces. These are things that people have studied in spectral theory, and these are the the natural objects that you have to consider. Now, um, uh, so as I said, you know, it turns out that these spectral traces factorize in anti holomorphic anti holomorphic blocks very much like the state integral of transcendence theory so state integrals remember are essentially non perturbative definitions of the perturbative series appearing in complex transcendence theory and in the same way these spectral traces are non perturbative definitions of this series and they turn out to have a very similar structure to the one that appears in complex transcendence theory and in particular they also factorize in holomorphic anti holomorphic blocks as Sarah actually found uh, in, 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 in these examples related to superconformative theories. And then this uh, was studied by Bean, Bean Mofti, and Sarah in a very beautiful paper that was very useful to us. So, so this story that I discovered, it turns out that there is a version of this story for these um, um, spectral traces that appear in, uh, appear in, 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 the, in the study of Tori Calabi of Marcos. Um, there is a very interesting twist to the story is that in what they did, they were finding a sort of symmetric structure in this factorization. And this is because complex transcendence theory is essentially S-dual. So the value at tau and the value at one over tau 
uh, of these state intervals is the same. Now, in, the, in this uh, topological string story, this is not true. There is not really a full symmetry. And then there is a factorization, but the blocks, the holomorphic blocks up in this factorization are different from the Hadley holomorphic blocks. So in a sense, there are like two different theories here. Mm -hmm. While in, if you want in complex string Simon's theory, you have rather two copies of the same theory, okay? Now, I, I, I don't want to kind of give you uh, the whole theory of, of, of for the topological string that we developed. So let me just uh, work out uh, uh, an example. So uh, the example is, is something that is, is actually chosen in such a way that you can actually give very specific results. So it's a very uh, popular Tori Calabilla, which is called local F0. So it's actually the local, the local Calabilla, which is used to geometrical engineer cyber weapon theory. Um, in this case, you know, this has the historic diagram. And it turns out in this case, the, the operator, the, 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 spectra, the operator that actually can be used to, to study this theory is very simple. It's obtained by quantizing this uh, mirror curve. So it's a very nice operator because it's the sum of two hyperbolic cosines, cosine of X and cosine of Y. And X and Y are just Heisenberg operators. So they commute to I times H bar. And as I say, H bar is essentially uh, related to the inverse of tau. Okay. So, so this is the quantum mechanical interpretation for the um, uh, topological string theory on the conifold locus for this uh, for this uh, Calabilla. Now, uh, let me just take the simplest case in which you just take n equal one. So this trace has an asymptotic expansion, and this asymptotic expansion is precisely gives me precisely the series that. Um, topological string theory gives me in this example. So this is the series phi g of tau. Uh, let me mention that this series comes with an, an exponential. And actually this exponential, for those of you who are familiar for the volume conjecture, this exponential is also related to the volume of, of the Calabillao in some way. So there is a, a, a sense in which uh, there is an analog of the volume conjecture for, for this state integral invariance also in this Calabillao context. And it turns out that this, um, the value of the exponent appearing here in this expansion is actually the value of the Keller parameter at the conifold point. Now, in, in this example, it turns out to be very much similar to the figure A naught. So it turns out that there is this series here, phi g of tau. But uh, when you do, when you analyze the resurgent structure, when you analyze the structure of singularities, you find that there is another series phi c of tau, which are also related by this involution. And uh, you can actually compute these those constants and they are integers. You can compute them very explicitly. You can actually make a, 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 a final conjecture that describes all these integer invariants. Uh, and these are really integer invariants defined by the genus expansion of topological string theory on this local Calabillao manifold. Now, uh, the only bad thing about this is that we don't really know what these uh, integer invariants are. I mean, so formally we have verified that these are integers. And we have verified this also in the case of local P2, but the precise meaning of these integers is not really known to us. We conjecture, of course, that this must be related to some counting of BPS states on the Calabillao, but uh, so far um, uh, we have not really clarified yet this issue. But uh, maybe one message to take home from this is that these are, this is an integrality structure appearing in topological string theory, which is completely different from the standard integrality structure that we are used to in terms of BPS invariance, Donaldson Thomas or, or Copacumar Bafa. This is really some integrality structure which is hidden in, in, in the conifold expansion. And it's as, as far as I know, it's not really related to these other integ integrality properties of the topological string. Okay. Okay, let me come to the conclusions because I'm really running out of time. So I hope I have, I have convinced you that resurgence is really a very powerful technique. It's very general, but in some cases, it, it actually has an additional uh, spin-off, which is a relationship to an integrality structure. And I think it, it's fair to say that the, the integrality of those constants up in here is really a new route to integrality, which is uh, different from routes to integrality that have been found by people in, in similar contexts. So in particular, this is different, for example, from Gopakumar Bafa integrality or Donaldson Thomas integrality. And it's also different from the integrality, for example, that appears in BPS invariance of three manifolds, where integrality appears rather uh, by looking at radial asymptotics of Q series uh, rather than looking at the Stokes constants. Uh, now, 
in the case of complex on Simon's theory, we have a really very complete picture. Um, and this is one of the few examples of a quantum field theory in which you can really compute, or at least conjecturally compute all the Stokes constants of the theory. And, 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 and I, I think it, it gives a very beautiful relationship between Stokes constants and BPS counting. And I think this really shows that, uh, you know, that this sort of relationship between analytic structures and integrality structures is really much wider than, than you could have originally thought. For example, based on the results of Gayoto Muranitsky, you know, there is already there this integrality structure, but I think the complex chain Simon's example is really very different and, and points out to a more general picture. Uh, as I said, uh, as, I, as, I, as I tried to explain, there is a, a very similar structure appearing in topological string theory in Calabria manifolds. Uh, it's very beautiful that the, formally the structures that appear in the topological string and in complex string samples are very, very similar. Also, we don't really still have a, a very physical relationship for a, a very physical explanation for this relationship. I mean, one is tempted to think that um, in the same way that complex string samples has some sort of super conformal theory dual, something similar should happen in this toric calabria case, but uh, we don't really have a, a very concrete picture for this. Mm -hmm. But we have, uh, we have really explicitly checked in many examples that this integrality structure is also there. Uh, and of course, there are many open questions. Uh, one very interesting problem is the following. Uh, and maybe this is the last thing I will say. Uh, one of the most beautiful, uh, for me, results of Gayoto Muranitsky was the connection to a Riemann-Hilbert problem. And essentially what, what, what they told us is that if you know all the Stokes constants, you can determine a priori all the, um, all the physical quantities of your problem. So in a sense, of, in, in, instead of computing perturbative series and resum them in order to get physical information, you can just compute the Stokes constants and through the Riemann-Hilbert problem, you will solve your physical problem. So uh, I think uh, complex string Simon's theory is really an example where this could be done because we really have conjecture against those constants and by an appropriate, an appropriate Riemann-Hilbert problem, one should be able to reconstruct all the state integral invariants uh, from them. So this is exactly the direction in which I am working on with my postdoc with Diego. And maybe, you know, I will be able to tell you more about this in, in a few months. So of course, you know, there are uh, other interesting questions. For example, what happens on compact Calabillaus? One could actually study this resonant property for compact Calabillaus and maybe one learns something interesting from them. Okay, let me stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Marcos, for the nice talk. So if you have questions, you can, I think, just uh, unmute yourself and go ahead. Hi, I had uh, two questions, if that's okay. Um, yeah. So my first question is, uh, so how can we understand the reduction of the Chern-Simons, complex Chern-Simons theory for on hyperbolic knots to a finite dimensional integral? Well, um, this is just, a, I mean, this is an example of a topological field theory in which you have an infinite Hilbert, spa an a Hilbert space of infinite dimension. So in the same way that compact Chern-Simons theory reduces to a sum where a, a, a finite sum, in the case of a Hilbert space of infinite dimension, you should get some sort of integral. So this is the basic idea. Okay. I see. Uh, so it's analogous to. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I see. That that okay. would be one way. That would be one way to think about it. Uh, but I think uh, another way to think about it is is using sort of localization ideas, right? I mean, you know. Uh, one can actually uh, reduce this uh, infinite dimensional path integral of complex and Simon's theory to a finite dimensional path integral, both in the case of uh, compact and non-compact gauge groups. So that would be another way to do it. But I guess you know the topological nature of the of, of the theory tells you that you know you should be able to do this. But I'm sure that there are people in the audience that know more about this than I. I mean, I have not really thought that much about that particular issue. In your explanation, you don't really use that. You're using a hyperbolic, uh, a I, hyperbolic property. In, in, of course, in, in concrete calculations, it's crucial that you have to use that, you know, the path integral reduces to this finite dimensional integral. At the end of the day, many of the analysis you do are based on this finite dimensional integral. So in terms of, compu in terms of computations, it's crucial. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, you, you have to do the full path integral, you know, it's much harder. And here, because of this reduction, you can, for example, just the very fact that you can produce 
long perturbative series which are needed to do this calculation of the Stokes constants, just that fact is already uh, is already uh, is already important, because uh, when you really actually one way of calculating those constants is actually by brute force by just computing hundreds of terms of the perturbative series and see and study the analytic structure of these Borel transforms. So these Borel transforms, if you have just three or four terms of your perturbative series, will not do. You really need hundreds of them. It's only when you have hundreds of terms of your perturbative series that you start seeing these singularities in the Borel plane, and you can start extracting information from them. So being able to produce hundreds of terms of perturbation theory is actually uh, something that we had to use. Probably clever people who are more clever than us maybe will not need that, but we actually needed that. And this actually, for that is actually crucial to have a simple description of the theory in terms of a finite dimensional integral. I see. Okay, and in answering that, you also answered my second question, which is how you actually compute these uh, Stokes matrices for the Chern Simons in practice. And you basically have to numerically analyze this. Uh, yes, uh, just on the technical side, I have to say that, you know, um, what is very important also is, is, that, um, is that you, hold, you have, uh, that you, can, you know that there is an analytic function behind your series. Mm -hmm. Now, usually it, this, is, this is just, this is not, that's, in principle, you don't need that to do the calculation of those constants, but it turns out that if you know that your series is an asymptotic expansion of a well-defined a, a well analytic function, the calculation it's much much more uh, is much more powerful. I mean, you can really compute many of those constants. So this was actually something that we use a lot in both topological string theory and complex chain Simon theory. Also, it's, it's not a question of principle. One of the one of the nice things about resurgence is that even if you don't know what is the non-perturbative object behind your perturbative series, you still can make sense of these Stokes constants. The definition of Stokes constants doesn't depend on that. It just depends on existence of uh, analytic continuations of your Borel transforms and so on, but it doesn't depend on having a non-protective definition of the theory. But it turns out that if you have this non-protective definition, then you can exploit it to make a faster calculation of these Stokes constants. Thanks. More questions? Uh, hey, Marcos. Uh, thanks a lot for the talk. Um, yeah. There, There is this work some years ago by uh, Lockhart and Waffer. Yes. Uh, like factorization of, I, I, I think it was partition functions in 5D, like yes. indices in 5D, um, that one would expect to be related to topological string amplitudes. Um, like, uh, do those factors, like, I don't know, th does that seem to have any relation to your story? Yes, yes, yes. They, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, there is, there is some relation to the story, absolutely, yeah, yeah. So, so what they wrote, what, I mean, the, the, the paper was, had this intuition that, uh, that essentially, you know, topological stream partition function is missing one half, right? And, 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 and they were saying that, you know, by using formal properties of the triple sign function, you could actually, at least formally, write down something similar to this, right? Now, what I think what I, the paper was missing was actually some object that made this well defined. And in a sense, uh, with our conjecture relating to spectral theory, you can see what is this object. So, for example, uh, in the case of these spectral traces, uh, these spectral traces are really well-defined objects, are, are completely rigorously mathematically well-defined. And actually, these objects, there you can see the factorization by calculation. So the factorization is not something that you postulate. It's really a consequence of a definition in terms of the spectral theory. So these spectral traces are well-defined. And when you compute them using the residue theorem, you actually get holomorphic anti-holomorphic factorization. So in a sense, our route was different. Uh, we, we started from a, from a non perturbative definition, and then, you know, this non perturbative definition had this holomorphic anti holomorphic factorization. And also, one difference is that uh, they were actually working at large radius. So they were actually doing an expansion in terms of Kopaku Marbach invariance at large radius. While the picture that I explained today here is, is a, a picture based on the conifer. We, we also have a picture 
a similar picture for large radius, but but that's a slightly different story. Do you, do you know an 11 dimensional interpretation of the spectral trace? What, I mean, yeah, I don't know how to answer like that. Like in terms of geometry. And... Right, um, no, I, we don't really, we don't have an interpretation in, in terms of geometry. Uh, I mean, let me give you an analogy, which might help, uh, which, but it's not precise. In, in complex transhumanist theory, that operator would be like the monodromy operator appearing in the Teichmuller theory of, of the knot. So you, you can think about these state integrals sometimes in terms of some operator in Teichmuller theory, and, and, this, and, and the trace of this operator is closely related to the state integral. So in a sense, that would be the operator. That, 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 but this is not really answering your question. It's just giving you some analogy that might, might help. Okay, thanks. So, so you could think that maybe, you know, there will be some sort of generalized type Muller theory for the historical of your manifolds and this operator will appear naturally there in this way, but I, I don't have a concrete picture of that. Thank you. Sorry, can I just, uh, uh, I mean, connect to, to this question. When you, I mean, for these trace operators, you observe the factorization only at the conifold points or is a property that you have uh, also at large radius or for generic, uh, um, killer parameters. Uh, the, the thing is that uh, the the, the spectral traces are are actually defined. Uh, uh, the spectral traces that I define are are already expansions on the conifold point. Yeah. Now there is an object which is more general, which is the spectral determinant. The spectral determinant is, in a sense, a collection of all the spectral traces with a given parameter. So that would be similar to complex trans and monster theory to turn on to turning on this modulus u. Okay. So you want when in complex trans and monster theory, the example that you know very well, right? So when you put u equal to zero, you are in a, at a special point in the moduli space of, of the of, of complex trans and monster theory. And there, you know, you have holomorphic factorization at u equals zero. And then you know, if you turn on u, you have a holomorphic factorization for arbitrary u, right? And you get these uh, nice vessel functions that you were working out in your paper and so on. Now, the spectral traces I'm looking at are more like expansions around u equals zero, but the spectral determinant of the spectral traces is a very beautiful function, and this function might have actually um, a, a, a factorization. But we don't know, and the reason is that in contrast to your case, in your case, the turning on, turning on u, you still have an integral representation for the partition function deformed by you. Mm -hmm. But uh, the threshold determinant of this uh, Calabi-Jaus, uh, we don't know if, we don't know any easy integral representation. So that's where we have some sort of abstraction. But I would expect some sort of factorization as well for this object, yeah. So this would be actually a factorization in the full complex moduli space of the calabi -Jaus. So are there any more questions? Yeah, I have a quick question, if that's okay. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. so um, uh, hi, Marcos. Um, hi. Uh, hi, uh, so my question was uh, related to this idea of whether you actually need this perturbative series to basically run your machine. Yes. So my question is in the context of, for example, more general supersymmetrically localized partition functions. Mm -hmm. so, there, it's a closed form, right? So you don't really have uh, a perturbative series per se. Yes. But of course, there are several indices, like BPS indices that you can compute, which Fine. pretty much look like the DGG uh, index that you had. So, yes, yes, yes. So is that a similar story where, where you can compute? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for this question. It's actually a very good thing because we were thinking about it. So, in a sense, in the context of 3D super theory, what we would be saying is the following. Take the partition function of your superconformal field theory on the squash three sphere okay. and expand in the squash parameter. So you will get a perturbative series, right? So this right. is all you can do. Now, mm -hmm. what we are saying is that the resurgent properties of that series are contained in the index, which is the partition function on S2 times S1. Okay. So from the point of view of superconformal field theory, for super field, and, and of course, you know. This is com this eventually is compatible with with the formula that we, we know that both three sphere and partition function S two times S one 
essentially use the same ingredients and this gets reflected into this statement but this statement i think is, is not obvious i mean it's not really an obvious statement because we are talking about uh, the analytic properties of these um, borel transforms and we are, we are saying that this is related to the index in, in a non-trivial way so this is related if you want uh, the, 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 the geometry on, you know, the structure of this series in S3 and the index uh, and the index on the other hand. So, so that, that would be, if you want the general, the analysis of our statement to more general super conformal field theories. Uh, but suppose you have a, you consider the index on say, um, on, a, on a generic S1 vibration on some, some sigma, like some Riemann surface. Mm -hmm. What is the corresponding 3D uh, uh, partition function that you need to compute with, with this? Like what is the analog of this B, S3B? Well, that's that's a different question. I mean, now you are asking me to interpret the index on, on a more complicated index in terms of, of, of something else. That I don't know. Uh, okay. What I would say is that, um, as I said, if you take uh, S3, squash S3, and you do the perturbative expansion in the squashing parameter, this mm -hmm. will be related to, to the standard index, okay? But okay. Uh, I, I think I think that there are. The, I mean, what is in a sense is beautiful from this is that the, the, the rigid structure of these objects actually allows you to actually solve the, the problem of resurgence for these series. And this is probably more general than what uh, they are, what I'm, I'm just saying now. And probably one could actually address the kind of questions that you are you are asking. You know, and, okay. and I'm, I'm sure that if one looks at this in well long enough, you know, something will show up. Yeah. But uh, the only statement I could make uh, kind of uh, with more or less, uh, you know, uh, certainty is what I just made. I see. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so any other question? So if not, let's uh, thank Marcos again. And... Um, Thank you. Thanks a lot. So we'll stop the recording. Um...